Ghetto Suguru is one of the most compelling villains in Jujutsu Kaisen, but how did he get there? How did he go from an upstanding moral beacon to an apathetic mass murderer? Today we will be diving into his transformation from hero to villain and deciphering exactly where he went wrong. So let's get into it. When we're first introduced to Ghetto, he has some pretty obvious moral standings. He believes that society should exist to uplift the weak and that it is the job of the strong to protect said weak and create a world where the weak can survive and maybe even thrive. In the context of Jujutsu Kaisen, he is of course talking about the non-sorcerers that him and Gojo are tasked with protecting, but it is also a moral standing based in reality. It is righteous and is based on ideologies relating to class solidarity and charitable action. Class solidarity is the idea that to stand up to oppressors, sectors of society need to stand together. Whether that's the working class or the middle class doesn't really matter. It is the best way to stand up to the people that are trying to exploit you. Based on how Ghetto speaks about non-sorcerers at the beginning, it's pretty clear that he sees himself as one of them, to an extent. He acts as an intermediary between the cursed spirits oppressing non-sorcerers and the non-sorcerers themselves, and as such he feels morally obligated to protect them in the way that he would a fellow sorcerer. This protection comes in the form of charitable action action. These are good moral ideas in general, but there is one flaw to them. They only work when the ones with power want them to. Once these ideals start getting in the way of the oppressor's endeavors, their moral standings become harder for them to defend. We've seen this happen time and time again in our world, where people move up the social ladder and leave behind the people that put them there. I believe that this is an intentional connection to show us that while Ghetto seems to have a strong moral foundation, it will only go so far before it starts to to crumble, and we do see it crumble. There are three main events that trigger Ghetto's transformation from hero to villain. The first is the death of Riko Amanai. While it was a sudden death from a person that Ghetto barely knew, it was clear from the start that he and Gojo regarded her as a friend and as a human whom they would not sacrifice. I think this connection to her is a major part of why her death had such a large impact on Ghetto, and the other major part is failure. Failure often changes a person. The title of strongest is is not one to be dealt out lightly. It means being at the peak of your field with a strength that should be insurmountable. To lose while holding this title would be a hit to one's ego, and would probably also change your perception of yourself. It is that kind of failure that makes you question what makes you, you. This is a sentiment that we see reflected in Ghetto when he goes to talk to Gojo a year after the incident. We'll be talking about that conversation later. The next event to nudge Ghetto off his moral path is the retrieval of Rico's body. In this sequence we see the smiling faces of every member of the star religious group as they clap for the death of a young teenage girl. These are the people that Ghetto is protecting and working for. These are the people he is risking his life for, and they all cheer for his failure and the failure of Gojo. Now, I think it's important to mention that these are not normal people, right? These are religious extremists, potentially full-blown cult members. They are not people who are fully there mentally, but it still doesn't feel good to walk in on. On this. I think this is specifically what we see Ghetto dealing with in the shower. The flashbacks we get are him trying to convince himself that these people are still worth protecting, that the weak in general are still worth protecting, and I think that belief is once again challenged by the tough summer, which is coincidentally the third major point. But before we can talk about that, we have to talk about Gojo for a little bit, and before we can talk about that, I need to ask you to subscribe. Look, I know it's kind of cringe, but we are so close to 10,000 subscribers, and I would really love if we could destroy that number. It's the first milestone that I actually really care about, and I would appreciate any support you can offer to get us there. Plus, you probably don't even check your subscription box, so what do you have to lose? Gojo's singular line, asking to kill the non-sorcerers, also plays a part in Ghetto's turn. It's the first time that Ghetto verbalizes his belief that there must be a reason behind killing non-sorcerers. This sets up the foundation for why Ghetto becomes okay with killing non-sorcerers. He later finds meaning in their death, as it becomes a way for him to guarantee to the end to cursed spirits. Now, obviously this idea is probably a bit misguided, but that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. This brings us to the final trigger, which is the Tough Summer. The Tough Summer is a multifaceted part of Ghetto's moral departure, and it also signifies the actual changes he begins to go under. First of all, we have the taste of cursed spirits. Constantly swallowing the taste of vomit with the texture of a rag is gross enough on its own, but I can't imagine thinking about why you are doing it each and every time. If you genuinely believe that the action is for the greater good, the taste might be worth dealing with, but if it's for no 
no reason other than saving people who are evil? The moral questioning is inevitable. We also have Ghetto's newfound loneliness. Scientific studies have shown that loneliness is one of the most dangerous things for a person's mental health. It can even have harsh physical effects similar to smoking cigarettes or eating artery-clogging food. So on top of this tough summer, Ghetto is also experiencing loneliness, likely for the first time in years. As Goju became stronger, both of them were met with loneliness, but only Ghetto had his consciousness working against him. It is often stated that when people are mentally ill or struggling with mental illness, their decision-making skills are less sharp, and they are, in general, more prone to making bad decisions or seeing things in a jaded or irrational way. I think this is happening to Ghetto here as well. While his beliefs do have some grounding based on what happened, it's pretty clear that he does lack logic in his thinking. The next important part of the tough summer is Ghetto's talk with Yuki. This is the first time that the thought of killing all non-sorcerers comes to Ghetto, or at least the first time the action would have meaning to him. That meaning, obviously, is an end to the creation of cursed spirits. This comes from his conversation with Yuki where we get some real insight into how his view of non-sorcerers has changed. He struggles to find the difference between the preciousness and ugliness of the weak. His view of non-sorcerers is kind of how I view toddlers. The line between when they're being adorable and when they're acting obscenely annoying is very thin, but this could also be a result of overexposure to an extent. Like when you watch one show too much or eat one type of food too much and just thinking about that thing makes you queasy. Except in Ghetto's case, if he stops thinking about it, people die. It's a pretty bad situation all around for him. The meeting ends with Yuki telling him that he still has time to make his final decision, and that there's more possibilities than just the ones he's thought of, before abruptly cutting to Haibara's death. Despite playing a very minor role and having a death that was only one panel, it's pretty clear that this moment did affect Ghetto quite a bit. A good-natured, hard-working kid was killed. And what did he die for? The ugliness of humanity? A light in the world of Jujutsu was snuffed out just so a couple of pieces of trash could live a little bit longer? It wasn't said in that moment, but I have a hard time believing that this isn't what Ghetto was thinking in the morgue. I should probably also talk about the marathon analogy before we get into the incident. To be honest though, I don't think there's much to say here. It is a pretty apt analogy for the world of Jujutsu, and the end not being clear or only holding pain must have a major effect on the mentality behind a Jujutsu sorcerer. Like if you're running a marathon, you at least know it will end. There is an end point, and that end comes with a sense of accomplishment. Knowing that there is a point where it ends also helps with motivation, as you can count down the miles or you will at least know that finishing is something you will do eventually. Running with no end in sight and doing so while your peers perish and the ugliness of humanity thrives cannot be a good combination for long-term success. We then arrive at that fateful day, the day Ghetto destroys a village and kills his own parents. As we have thoroughly established in this video, this incident is not the sole reason for his transformation, but it is the final straw that breaks him. Seeing two children bloodied and abused in a cage would be upsetting to any sorcerer, but it's even worse when the people of the village do not listen to Ghetto, and instead want to go ahead and blame him as well. When we look at everything that's going on inside Ghetto's head, from the ugliness of the weak, to creating a world free of cursed spirits, to the mental health issues he was likely struggling with, his decision to slaughter the village becomes much clearer. To him, it was the means to an end, and the beginning of a solution. A solution that could save the lives of the people he cared about. In a way, his morals haven't actually changed that much. He is still acting in the interest of the greater good, it is just that his definition of the greater good has changed. Whereas before he believed that the preservation of the masses was the most important objective, he now believes that preservation of his loved ones is the greater good, even if it means forsaking himself as well. We can see this clearly when he meets with Gojo and Shoko. He states a couple of times that he doesn't need anyone else to understand his motivations, implying that he is okay with them hating him. This conversation also seems to be the first time that we've seen Ghetto at peace since Rico's passing. He's got that look in his eyes like he just took a nice shit. I know that sounds obscene, but hear me out. The sensation of a good poop is a hard one to mimic. It can really only be created by a sense of satisfaction or by resolving a major life event. For Ghetto, this moral conflict was a major event. Killing those people and deciding to go down the path that he chose seems like it truly did put his mind at ease. He truly believes in the cause that he is now following, and he has accepted the consequences of the potential actions. He also tries to convince Gojo to join his cause, but it doesn't really work. It does, however, bring back the idea of strength like we talked about at the beginning of the video. He asks Gojo how his strength relates to him, and whether he defines it or it defines him. We don't really have a clear answer on this, but Gojo 
Gojo does let Ghetto go. This conversation scene is much more about Gojo than it is about Ghetto. It shows that his morals have developed too as he's gotten stronger. It seems like the strength he developed has given him a greater sense of responsibility, but it's not all encompassing. While he does want to save as many people as possible, Gojo also realizes he cannot save those who do not wish to be saved. This is some pretty huge development for Gojo, and it further separates the two. Instead of falling into despair from his failure, Gojo has risen to the occasion, determined to save people and live up to the title of the strongest. We don't see anything from Ghetto for the next decade, but when we do see him again, he seems overall happier. He's definitely at least a bit more unhinged than he was as a teen, but he's also definitely less depressed. I think this is because he has created his own band of people that he can confide in. He's created a family of cursed users and they prevent him from falling into loneliness. It is a fairly small aspect of his life compared to his cursed collection, but it's still a very important part. At this point in his life, his main motivation is absorbing Rika, as he believes defeating and controlling her will give him enough power to defeat Gojo. Now let's pause for a second. Based on what we know now, is Rika strong enough to give Ghetto an advantage over Gojo? No. No shot. But remember, Jujutsu Kaisen Zero is basically a pilot for Jujutsu Kaisen, so the power scaling is not quite finalized and Gojo is not nearly as strong as he is in the main JJK universe. Unfortunately, due to that nature of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, we don't get to see a lot of Ghetto, and when we do, it is pretty one-dimensional. He exists as a straightforward villain, and we don't get to see much of his personality or any development of his motivation. The closest we get to any depth is in his death, because that is when we learn that even after everything, Gojo still considers Ghetto his best friend. It is at this point that Ghetto gives up. He is pretty heavily wounded, and he is in the face of the strongest Jujutsu sorcerer. He cannot live in a situation like this, so he dies in peace. Ghetto is such an interesting interpretation of how a person's morals change based on their experiences. He's one of my favorite characters in Jujutsu Kaisen, and he's one of my favorite villains in general. It's hard to find ones that are done quite like him. If you made it this far in the video, please consider subscribing. It would really help me out a lot, and I would appreciate it very much. If you want to support the channel in other ways, you could watch another one of my videos or maybe drop a membership, but no pressure on that. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again in a little bit.